Greetings, brethren, and welcome to the Feast of Pentecost 2013. The Feast of Pentecost is a tremendous feast, and it pictures the first resurrection, and that's when we will be born again. Now we understand this. Jesus Christ was the first of the first fruits. When he was born of the Virgin Mary, he was called the firstborn. When he was resurrected from the dead, Revelation, the first chapter, he is called the firstborn from among the dead. And so the harvest of God begins with the wave sheaf offering, as we covered yesterday, and ends with the 50th day, which is the day of Pentecost. So let's come back here to Revelation correction. Let's come back here to Leviticus 23, and let's review just a couple of things that we covered yesterday. Now, we also understand that on this day, it's also called the Feast of Weeks. Now, we are to bring an offering to God. And especially on this day when you consider everything that God is doing for us. This is a tremendous day. This pictures, as we have seen, the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts, the second chapter, which began the church, which is spiritual Israel. It is the completion of God's plan for those in the first resurrection. Those who are called now reaches clear back to the time from the beginning. So all the saints and all will be resurrected, born again of the Spirit at the first resurrection. That is the harvest of God. Now let's look at it another way. Let's understand something else. In John the 6th chapter, Jesus said that he would raise us up at the last day. Now, some people have thought that is referring to the last great day at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. However, it's not. Consider this. There are seven holy days plus the Passover. Now, consider this in conjunction with it. There is the sacred year, which begins in the first month in the spring. There is the calculated Hebrew calendar and civil and uh, kingship beginning of the year, which is the Feast of Trumpets. Now, if you count from Passover and unleavened bread, the last day is the last great day of the feast after the Feast of Tabernacles. However, if you count the number of holy days beginning with trumpets, Pentecost is the last day. So you count it through. Trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, last great day. First day of unleavened bread, last day of unleavened bread, and Pentecost. There you go. The last day. So you see, when Jesus makes certain statements, let's understand this. Some of them can only be interpreted when we really understand not only the Word of God, but the plan of God is laid out with His holy days. That's the structure. And remember, God does mighty things on his holy days. And the greatest thing that is going to be will be the resurrection of the dead for all the faithful down through time. Now, let's keep that in mind when we give an offering. Okay? We're to bring an offering to God. And it lists out 
the offerings that were to be given by the priesthood. So we'll go back and review that again. But just remember this. The most important thing is that we be in that harvest of the first resurrection. And the way that we are faithful and do the things that are right is if we are faithful to God in everything. Now, in addition to the regular tithes and offerings, God requires offerings. Here in Deuteronomy 16, he tells us in the Feast of Weeks we are to bring an offering. And we also know that that has nothing to do with the sacrifices that are given. But it should come from our substance as we find in Proverbs the third chapter. So here in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 16 we find this. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose to place his name in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So that has to do with our loving God, serving God, obeying God, wanting to do the things that please him. Now we also have the guarantee in the New Testament of this, that if we sow sparingly, we'll reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully, we will reap bountifully. And God is able to make all grace abound toward us, so that regardless of our circumstances, we will always have sufficiency in all things. So at this time, let's go ahead and take a pause, and let's go ahead and take up the offering. Now, since we're here in Leviticus 23, let's just look at a couple things to refresh our memory and to understand concerning the Feast of Pentecost and some of the symbolism that is there with the offerings. Now, we know this. The beginning of the count toward Pentecost is the wave sheaf offering day, and that pictured the acceptance of Jesus Christ after his resurrection on the weekly Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then we were to count seven weeks complete with the Sabbath. Then we were to come to the seventh Sabbath, so let's look at it right here, and let's see what it says concerning that. All right, verse 11. You shall count to you beginning with the next day after the Sabbath, beginning with the day that you brought the sh uh, sheaf of the wave offering, even seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Forty-nine days, that was yesterday. Even unto the day after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number fifty days. Now just stop and think for just a minute. The only day that can come after a Sabbath is the first day of the week. That's why you cannot have a Monday Pentecost ever under any circumstances regardless if there are those who claim that that is so then they have miscounted and they make the gravest error possible which is this since the first day of the count pictures the wave chief offering, and that was to be the day picturing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that has already happened. If they begin their count on the next day after that, they are excluding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that portend? Hmm? I'll let you think on that for a little bit. Therefore, for those who kept that, and even one church said, well, we kept it on Monday for 40 years and God bound it. Well, 
Did God bind Sunday keeping or Christmas keeping or New Year's keeping? No, he did not. What was the penalty for keeping it on Monday? They didn't understand that Pentecost was the day picturing the first resurrection. Because, see, it's a continuous count from day one to day 50. There are the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, as we saw yesterday. And the offering that the priests were to bring had seven lambs, also picturing the seven churches. Then it had a sin offering, then it had a bullock offering, and those are symbolic of Christ. Now then, we saw yesterday also that the kingdom of God was likened unto leaven. Now here's a good use of leaven. You put leaven into the flour, you put leaven into the dough, and you let it leaven. Now, what happens when it reaches the size that you want? Well, you put it in the oven and bake it. That permanently changes the nature of the dough, and it becomes bread. Now, isn't that interesting? What happens when we're born again? What happens to us at the resurrection? Well, we're changed. Let's see that. Let's come back here to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and we will see the direct connection that Paul makes between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our future resurrection. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. So let's turn there. The whole chapter is devoted to the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection. Now, Paul made it absolutely clear. Now, there were some in the church, even in Paul's day, that didn't have the knowledge of God. There were even those saying that the resurrection had passed. Which means that was the beginning teaching of the immortality of the soul creeping into the churches of God. Now, what does Orthodox Christianity believe? Now, you stop and look at it, what it is in the Bible, and you will see that virtually nothing that is taught in Orthodox Christianity has anything to do with the truth or the New Testament or the Bible all traditions of men. And just like Jesus said, when you follow the traditions of men, full well you reject the commandments of God. So likewise here, 1 Corinthians 15, because Christ has been raised from the dead, we have our sins forgiven. Because Paul says here, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And that makes God, the God of truth, a liar. However, it's impossible for God to lie. So you see what happens when men bring in their own ideas and start hanging them on the scriptures? Yes, indeed. Also, but if Christ has not been raised, your faith is vain and you are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have then perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most miserable. But now Christ has been raised from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Now, the Apostle James wrote, just put this in your note, James 1.18, that we are like the first fruits of his creation. Now, stop and think about that a minute. 
for those who are called now and have the Spirit of God now, is God creating in us the spiritual character that we need? Yes, we're created in Jesus Christ. We're created in truth and in holiness. We are the workmanship of God the Father in our life preparing us for the resurrection. Now notice verse 20. Here is the key. Christ is raised from the dead and presented to the Father to begin to count to Pentecost. Verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruit, actually the first of the first fruit, the premier sheaf of the wave offering, the first one raised from the dead, the first one born again from flesh to spirit. Then, those who are Christ's at his coming. All right, now let's come down here and see some things concerning the resurrection from the dead. Right here in verse, let's come down here to verse 40. Oh, verse, okay, verse 35. <laughs> All right, verse 35. Nevertheless, someone will say, how are the dead raised? Well, remember, nothing is impossible for God. Now, I want you to think about your beginning as a physical human being. You were just a pinpoint of life. How is it that you became what you are today? Hmm? By the power of God by the genes and chromosomes that God created and put into Adam and Eve and has been transmitted to all human beings from that time until this time. So how were the dead raised? You must first have the Holy Spirit of God. You must first be perfected in Christ. And if you live out your life and die, then as we saw yesterday, the Spirit returns to God and is put right there at the altar waiting the time of the resurrection. Because you see, the Spirit has no thought until it's put into a spirit mind and a spirit body. And so then when the resurrection takes place, we'll be reconstituted from flesh to spirit. The parallel of that is the conception and birth of human life. All right. Question. And with what body do they come? Obviously, it's not our physical body. Fool. Paul's called them fools. Now notice how this fits in with the Feast of Pentecost. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that shall be. Rather, it is bare grain. It may be of wheat or one of the other grains, and God gives it a body according to his will and to each of the seeds its own body. So, that's why we are begotten with the seed of God the Father, the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the Spirit of Christ, so that together we develop the mind of Christ and the character of God the Father going forward to the resurrection. Now verse 38, And God gives it a body according to his will. Okay? And to each of the seeds its own body. We are all individual before God. 
but he is developing us into his spiritual children. And the first resurrection on Pentecost will be the day of being born again. And as Jesus said, anyone who has been born again is like the wind, spirit. And you can go wherever you want to go, but you can't see it. It's like the wind. Have you ever seen the wind? No, you have seen the effects of the wind by moving the trees or whatever it may be. But you can't see the wind because it's invisible. Same way with the Spirit of God. It is invisible. But it does the work within us and will do the work that God sends it to and will be accomplished and finished at the resurrection. So Paul draws the parallel and shows us here, verse 39. Likewise, not all flesh is the same flesh. Rather, there is one flesh of men, another flesh of beast, another of fish, another of birds. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is different and the glory of the earthly is different. And today we can understand that more than ever before. There's the glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. And what did Daniel write? That those who are resurrected to the first resurrection will what? Shine as the stars of heaven. And we will have glorious bodies. We'll see how Paul brings that out. Now, in these, some of these things we can understand very clearly. Other parts of it, it's like looking through a glass darkly. And our understanding is not complete. Now he says here, verse 42, Everything that we have covered, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Now you stop and think about that. What God has called us to is absolutely marvelous and fantastic. To live forever as a glorified spirit being. Now think of that. Now, if you haven't gone through the series that we have done, Why God Hates Religion, you can download it from on site, you can email us and order it, or you can call the office and order it, and we will send it to you. Because the truth is this. Every single religion of this world is a counterfeit of God's way as found in the scriptures. Now let's go on here. Notice verse 44. It is sown a natural body, flesh. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. First comes the physical, then comes the spiritual. And that's what he writes here concerning Adam. Accordingly, it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul. The last Adam became an ever-living spirit. However, the spiritual was not first, but the natural then the spiritual. Now let's understand something. New Age religion is probably not much more different than Mormon explanation of how we came to be human beings, which is this. We existed as spirits in heaven before we came to the earth or were sent to the earth to become human beings. Now stop and think about that. Oprah Winfrey preaches the same thing. You are God within. And what you, what you have to do through your own goodness and your own works is find the God within. And when you do, then you will be complete. No, you won't. 
unless you repent or baptize and have the Spirit of God and attain to the first resurrection, you will never be complete. Those are all counterfeits. All right? Verse 46, however, the spiritual was not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man of the earth made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as the one made of dust is, so also are all of those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly one, so also are all of those who are heavenly. Now notice. Here is a promise, because a lot of people think, oh, I'll never make it. Yes, you will. God is going to bring you there. God will make it happen. Yes, we have our part. But as Jesus said, he's not going to lose one that the Father has given him. All who have fallen away are those who were not of God. Now, verse 49, as we have borne the image of the one made of dust, which we have, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one, that is Christ. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery or a secret hidden from the world. They don't understand this. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and the last trump is the seventh trump, and that is blown on Pentecost, just like the trumpet at the mountain when God gave the Ten Commandments. The Feast of Trumpets cannot be the day of the resurrection. That is a war feast. How do you know there to have a memorial of blowing of trumpets? How do you know when the first one begins? You can figure that out. But since they blow them periodically through the day on the Feast of Trumpets, when does the last trumpet sound? And if it sounds at sunset, the day is over, so trumpets cannot be the day of the resurrection. All right, let's go on. Let's finish this here. We will be changed at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Because you see, for this corruptible must put on incorruptibility and this mortal must put on immortality. And that can only come from God. Now when the corruptible shall have put on incorruptibility and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Yes, it will be. All right, now let's go forward. There are some things that we need to cover. Let's come to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, where it talks about the resurrection here. Now, let's come to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, and verse 14. Now, here's another thing to understand with the scriptures. In some cases, it starts out with a proposition, and then it explains the proposition after it has been stated. Now, this is what Paul does here. This does not give any credence at all to souls going to heaven. Verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 4. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in exactly the same way also, those who have fallen asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. All right. 
how do we get from here to there? So we can bring, or rather be with Christ, so he will bring us all back. Let's see, he explains it. For this we say to you by the word of God, that those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall in no wise precede those who have fallen asleep. Because the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead, shall, the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds for the meeting with the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. And what does Jesus do? And the saints who have been resurrected, what do they do? As we will see, we all come back to the earth. All right? We have important things to do. Now, let's come to the book of Revelation. And let's pick up where we left off last time. Book of Revelation. And we finished with chapter 3. Now, when you read the book of Revelation, what you need to do is look at it this way. From chapter 1 through chapter 11 is a continuous flow of time and major events from chapter 1 until the resurrection. After that, other events take place. Then you have different chapters which picture different things and then it all catches up in time at Revelation 19. Now, right after chapter 3 and the Laodiceans, where we finished yesterday, we have the scene of the throne of God where everything at the end time emanates. Jesus opens the seals. Jesus is the only one who can do it. And he opens them. One, two, three, four. The first four happened very quickly. Revelation, the sixth chapter. Now, I'm just going to review some of these things because we covered them before in the past, but I want to emphasize something else today. Now, remember, there are seven weeks plus one day in the count toward Pentecost. The seven churches also pictured by the seven lambs of Leviticus 23, are the seven weeks, prophetically, of the harvest of the church. But there is yet one more day, one more harvest, and that's the harvest of God. Now we find that when the sixth seal is opened, this is when God dramatically reveals the return of Jesus Christ. Now, right now, I don't know if you've been watching on the History Channel or other channels like that, but they're talking about aliens invading the earth. Now, they're wrong in what they are assuming the aliens to be. But they are correct. Aliens are going to invade the earth, and that is Jesus Christ and the saints, because we are aliens to this world. And they will think that the attack is going to begin or starting when the sixth seal of Revelation chapter 6 is open, verse 12. So let's read it. Revelation 6 and verse 12. 
And when he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, and there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as the hair of sackcloth, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its untimely figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the heavens departed like a scroll that is being rolled up. This is going to be an astonishing event. And the world is not going to realize what is happening. There will be some who say, oh, this is Christ returning. But Satan will deceive them into thinking that these are aliens coming to take away the perfected Babylon the Great that Satan has perfected. And that will be true. But we're not going to be the egg-headed aliens that are pictured by this world. Those are all satanic deceptions. Now then, let's see what happened when it's rolled back as a scroll. Just think of that. Something that has never happened in the history of mankind. And neither has the resurrection of the dead. For as many as there will be in the first resurrection ever happened, happen again. So this is setting the stage. Notice. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the powerful men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the earth. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us! Well, they changed their mind a little later. After that's all over, they gather things together. And then the battle really begins. And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the la wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of his wrath is come, and who has the power to stand? No one is going to turn back God. No one is going to turn back Jesus Christ. Now, chapter 7 has the prophecy of the 144,000 and the great innumerable multitude. Now this is going to happen, and I've given other sermons, about two years, beginning of the third year, of the last three and a half years. So from just before Pentecost, that's when this rolling back of the heavens should be. Until the Feast of Trumpets, the whole world is going to need that time to recover from these earthquakes. And in the meantime, God is going to do exactly as he did in sparing the children of Israel when they were in Egypt before he brought them out with the Exodus to bring them to him self as a people at Mount Sinai, he is going to cut off the plagues from the children of Israel and the great innumerable multitude. Now this represents the 50th day harvest of the Pentecost one year before the resurrection. Those who are of the 144,000 and great innumerable multitude are those who are of the laborers of the vineyard who were hired at the 11th hour and also received a silver coin, which was a type of eternal life. So let's see what happens here. And then we will make a comparison between the 144,000 of Revelation 7 and then the 144,000 in Revelation 14. Now verse 1, chapter 7. 
And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that the wind might not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, and having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to damage the earth and the sea, saying, Do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now question, what does it mean to be sealed? Well, we find from Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 13 and 14, that if we have the, the first fruit of the Spirit, we have been sealed. So everyone who is now converted has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. These, who are of the 144,000, have not been converted until they have been sealed. Now remember this, and it's important to understand. Here's another principle, see. This is why we need to know our Bibles forward and backwards, all the way through type and anti-type. Remember, Israel was the firstborn of the nations, as God called Israel. They were to bring the laws and commandments of God to the world. They failed. The church, as we saw, is called the firstborn of the church. Jesus being the first of the firstborn. We also have seen in the New Testament that the preaching was to go first to the Jews and the Israelites, then to the Gentiles. Now here in God's 50th day harvest that we see in chapter 7, we see the same principles applied. And we see God's promises carried out to the very letter. So let's read it. And the sealing of them is accommodated by angels who bring the Holy Spirit of God to them because there aren't any ministers left to baptize them. Okay? So God does this personally. Think of this as Jesus Christ and God the Father's personal harvest of untold number of people at the 11th hour who will be in the kingdom of God. Now, since they are doing this directly from the throne of God in heaven above, I myself suppose that it's going to be a greater number than have been converted from the time of Christ down to now, up to this point. So let's see what it says here. Verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of the children of Israel. All right. Where do they come from? Who are they as human beings? They are descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. The answer is right there. Can't be any of us today. We are part of the seven-week harvest. This is God's next to the last Pentecost harvest and conversion. Let's rephrase that. Conversion and then harvest at the next Pentecost. Now notice verse 5. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. In Zechariah 12, it says that God is going to save the tents of Judah first. 
Did that not also apply at the beginning of the church on the day of Pentecost in Acts the second chapter? To the Jew first, then to the Gentile. Because God has set the order. Someone has got to be first. But that doesn't exclude others. So then it lists all of them from all the 12 tribes. They're still physical human beings. They are divinely converted by God, giving them the Holy Spirit under the selection that God has made through the power of this mighty angel to accomplish it. Now come down here to verse 9. Don't you think with all the events that are happening on the earth that there will be people everywhere falling on their knees, crying out to God, asking for mercy, asking for forgiveness, asking for understanding, asking that God would spare them? Of course! Verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one was able to number. Now, we don't know how many it is, do we? Notice, out of every nation and tribe and people and language, now it shows that they are going to go into the kingdom of God. This is a projection forward toward the resurrection. This shows that the 144,000 of Revelation 7 and the great innumerable multitude are going to be in the first resurrection. But remember, as we have read, the resurrection does not take place until the trumpet sounds. The last trumpet. So it shows here, was standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, holding palms in their hands, and they were calling out with a loud voice to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, saying, The salvation of our God has come. Then all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God into the ages of eternity. Amen. And one of the elders answered and said to me, These who are clothed with white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know, and he said to me, they are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and have made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and the one who sits on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall not hunger any more, nor shall they thirst any more, neither shall the sun uh, nor the heat fall upon them, because the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them, and he will lead them to fountains of living waters, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now let's just review what we have here with 144,000 of Revelation 7. And then we will go to, now I'm going to have this all listed out in a list for you so you can follow along with it during the sermon. So we're going to see there are 10 things that distinguish 144,000 in Revelation 7 and the great innumerable multitude as compared to Revelation 14. Number one, they're of the children of Israel. Number two, the great innumerable multitude. Number three, they came out of great tribulation. Number four, they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Number five, they are before the throne of God. Number six, they serve him day and night. Number seven, 
God the Father will dwell among them. Number eight, the Lamb will feed them. Number nine, he will lead them to living waters. Number ten, God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. So that's quite a thing, isn't it? Yes, indeed. All right. Now, I'm not going to go through chapter 8, chapter 9, or chapter 10, but let's come ahead and we will come to Revelation, the 14th chapter. Now, Revelation 14 is a very interesting chapter. Now, this is not in direct sequence of time beginning from chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. There are several elements here that we need to understand. So we'll come back to the 144,000 of Revelation 14 in just a minute, or after we take a break. But let's begin here in verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth. And to every nation and tribe and language and people. All right. This has to be at the time of the beginning of the tribulation. Now, we don't know how many times that this angel does it. But this is probably going to result in the repentance of the children of Israel, great innumerable multitude, in chapter 7. And here's their message. Fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of water. All right. Second angel followed saying, The great city Babylon is fallen, is fallen. because of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, which she has given all nations to drink. The end of Babylon the Great, and that is detailed in Revelation, the 18th chapter. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. Now, we have to understand that this must come before the enforcement of, of the mark of the beast, it would do absolutely no good for the third angel's message about the mark of the beast to be given after they've already enforced it. Otherwise, there would be people who would not have an opportunity to turn it down. So this is a warning, and it must must be just before they're ready to enforce the mark of the beast. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image and receives the mark in his forehead or in his hand, he shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath, and he shall be tormented in fire and brimstone in the sight of the holy angels and of the Lamb. All right. That must be given before its enforcement. Now, let's come down here to verse 12. This follows right along with it and will now make more sense. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And I heard another voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from this time forward. Well, if this happened at the end of the tribulation, there would be no commandment keeping. There would be no more time forward. Okay? So these are the ones who are martyred. These are the saints that are spoken of back in Revelation, the sixth chapter, with the fifth seal. They are martyred. 
And I heard a voice from heaven say to me, right, blessed are the dead, yes, from this time forward, yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, that is, be put in the grave, and their works follow them. All right. Now, when we come back from the break, we will go ahead and we will analyze the 144,000 of Revelation 14. Now let's continue on and let's look at the 144,000 of Revelation 14. And we will see that they are entirely different. let's say, group, then 144,000 of Revelation 7. But first of all, let's do just a little review. We've already covered 1 Thessalonians correction, 1 Thessalonians the fourth chapter. Now, we know Let's read verse 16 and 17 again, 1 Thessalonians 4. Because the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of command and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We also saw in 1 Corinthians 15 that the dead will be raised at the last trumpet. We also know from the commands in the Old Testament that on every holy day a trumpet was to be blown. And on Pentecost, when God brought the children of Israel to take them as his people and give them his Ten Commandments and make the covenant with them, the trumpet sounded long and loud, but it was only one trumpet. Now, in the book of Revelation, we find that there are seven trumpets. Revelation 8 and 9 and 10 and 11. Now, we will read about that uh, last trumpet there in just a minute, Revelation 11, and then we'll come to Revelation 14. Okay? Now let's see what happens when the trumpet sounds. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds for the meeting with the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Now remember this. 1 Corinthians 15, it says, and each one in his own order. So the day of the resurrection being the day of Pentecost, being 24 hours long, in each location on the earth. But also remember this. When you view it from heaven, from God's throne down to the earth, each day is 48 hours. Because it takes... 24 hours in any one location to go from sunset to sunset. That's why in Australia, they keep the Sabbath, because the Sabbath starts there in New Zealand and Australia first, on the day we call Friday here. And they begin what we would call Thursday night here. Because whatever time it is over there, when sunset comes on the seventh day of the week, or a holy day comes and sunset arrives, that's when it begins. And there are 24 time zones for the day and 24 time zones for the night. And so that is 48 hours. Now, I believe that the resurrection is going to be 
seen by everyone on the earth. And it's going to be a tremendous thing. We will not all be raised at the same instant. The trumpet will sound and the dead will start being raised. And as they are being raised in the different time zones around the world, then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up and meet Christ in the air. So the question is, where? All right. Let's come to Hebrews 12. We have part of the answer here. Okay. Verse 18. All right, nope. Let's come down here to verse 22. But you, as compared to Mount Sinai, with Moses and the children of Israel, have come to Mount Sion, that's in heaven above, and to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the joyous festival gathering, and to the church of the firstborn, now, when the resurrection starts, the church of the firstborn begins being taken to God. And where will they be taken? We will see to a sea of glass, which will be seen by the whole world. All right? And to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the just having been perfected. Now let's come back to Revelation 11. And let's see that this is the seventh trump, and out of seven trumpet plagues, it's the last one. It cannot be any other trumpet. All right? Now let's pick it up here in verse 11. Revelation 11, rather, and verse 14. Revelation 11 and verse 14. And the second woe is past. And behold, the third woe is coming immediately. Then... The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. Now there were seven trumpets, seven angels. Here's the seventh one sounding his trumpet. This is the last trumpet. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign into the ages of eternity. And the 24 elders who sit before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, who is and who was and who is to come, for you have taken to yourself your great power and have reigned. And the nations were angry, and your wrath has come. That's the seven last plagues which come after the seventh trump. And the time for the dead to be judged. Yes, indeed. All of those who died in the faith will be resurrected. That's their judgment. And to give reward to your servants, the prophets, and to the saints. The prophets go back to the time of the Old Testament. And all those who fear your name, the small and the great, the great innumerable multitude, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Now notice what happens here. And the temple in, of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were thunder, lightnings and voices and thunders and, and, and earthquake and great hail. What an introduction to being raised from the dead. Now let's come to Revelation 14. Remember, each man in his own order. Now, let's be very careful when we read this, so we'll read it, then we'll go back and analyze it. And as you will have on your printout, you will have a comparison between 
the 144,000 in great innumerable multitude of Revelation 7, and the 144,000 of Revelation 14. We will see these are two distinct groups. Let's begin in verse 1, Revelation 14. And I looked, and I beheld the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. That's where we're going to go. Mount Zion and the Sea of Glass right there together. And with him, 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Then I beheld a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of, a, of great thunder. And I heard the sound of lyre playing players playing their lyres, special stringed instrument. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one was able to learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And no guile was found in their mouths, for they are blameless before the throne of God. Now let's analyze this a bit. Let's see the comparison between Revelation 7, Revelation 14. Number one, they're standing on Mount Sion. Number two, they have the name of their father written in their foreheads. Number three, they sing a new song. Now notice that's entirely different than Revelation 7. Number four, they are not defiled with women, and women mean false churches. Remember the great harlot, Babylon the Great? They are virgins, meaning that once they were sealed with the Spirit of God, they never went back into the religions of this world. Now we'll look at that in just a little bit and think on that. Number six, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Number seven, key important thing, they were redeemed from among men. Also, we will add to that, in addition to being redeemed from among men, they were redeemed from the earth. Now, the 144,000 of Revelation 7 were redeemed from among the children of Israel. Okay? There's first fruits, number eight, first fruits unto God and the Lamb. They have no guile in them, and they are blameless before God and his throne. Now, who could this be? Now, we might have kind of a sample of it from Revelation 2 and 3 having to do with the seven churches. Now, of the seven churches, only two were without correction. One had lost its first love. The others were corrupted by the religious system of this world. So they lost their spiritual virginity, so to speak, when they did that. 
because all of the religions of the world come from what? Babylon, the great. Now, have churches of God been inflicted with this? Yes, indeed. Have there been those who in doing this can repent of it and still be in the kingdom of God? Yes. But there are no longer virgins. Now, the only two of the seven churches that did not have spiritual problems resulting in committing fornication with other religions was number one, the church at Smyrna. Number two, the church at Philadelphia. Now, that's the closest we can come to answering the question, who are they? They were redeemed from the earth, so that goes clear back to the time of Abel. That includes all the prophets, all the faithful prophets, and so forth. So the 144,000 of Revelation 14 are in a special and different category than 144,000 and the great innumerable multitude of Revelation the seventh chapter. All right, now let's look at some other things here. Now, Revelation 14. Let's come down here to verse 14. Now this comes the time of the resurrection. Now we know two things about the harvest. Number one, there's the wheat harvest. We are likened to wheat or barley. Number two, Israel in Isaiah the fifth chapter was a holy good vine which God planted in his vineyard. And they corrupted themselves and became a holy corrupt vine. We also know that Jesus said that there was um, the rich man who went back to receive a kingdom from the Father and after he had planted a vineyard and built a wine a vat and everything else and leased it out to husbandmen. And he sent his servants to get the fruit in time of, of harvest. And you know the story what happened. That's likened to the vine of Israel. Now when it comes to the church, Jesus said, he was the vine and we are the branches. And we are to produce fruit and we are to remain in the vine. Now when we come to Revelation 14, we find the comparison made to the ripe grapes of the good vine. So let's read it. Revelation 14 and verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and one like the Son of Man sitting on the cloud, having a golden crown on his head, and in his hand was a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, because the time has come for you to reap the harvest of the earth. Now we find there are two harvests. Number one, the harvest of the church. Number two, the harvest of the wicked as pictured by the battle of Armageddon. All right? And also Joel the third chapter and Joel the second chapter, etc. Verse 16, And he who is sitting on the cloud thrust 
forth his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel, who also had a sharp sickle, came out of the temple. Now here's the harvest of the wicked. And they are crushed by God. Another angel came who had authority over fire and called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the grapes uh, of the earth because her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So that is the harvest of the wicked at the time of the battle of Armageddon. And the wine press was trodden in outside the city and blood spewed out from the wine press as high as the horse's bridle to a distance of 1,600 furlongs. Now then, we come to chapter 15. Now chapter 15 becomes a very important chapter. Now I've given sermons in the past, and you can look this up in the book, uh, God's Plan for Mankind, in the series of sermons leading up to Pentecost, that with this, the sea of glass... We find the sea of glass that was used by God in Exodus, the 24th chapter. So when Moses went up back up to receive everything from God and confirm the covenant, after they had already sprinkled the blood and so forth, 70 of the children of Israel, the elders, they went up part way. Aaron went up part way, Joshua went up part way, and Moses went directly up to God. Now then, when they were there on Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai rather, the 70 of the elders, they ate the festival dinner provided by God. They were witnesses that it was God who had talked to Moses. They didn't see God. They saw the sea of glass. And they saw Moses go up there. Okay. Now, carry that forward to Mount Zion. Mount Zion coming from heaven, and now the sea of glass. So we find that in Revelation 15. Then I heard a correction, verse 1, Revelation 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and awesome, seven angels, having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is filled up. Okay, now notice, we're at the temple of God when we see this, okay? So here's the sea of glass. Then verse 2 talks about it. And I saw a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who had gotten victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the liars of God. So where is the meeting going to be held when we're resurrected? In the clouds, on the sea of glass. Now where will this sea of glass be? Well, since the plagues are going to be poured out on, army, uh, on the armies gathering to Armageddon, and poured out on the earth, it is right over Jerusalem. And the reason that they're going to fight Christ is because they will believe that this is the invasion of aliens from outer space. Now notice, 
who this includes, remember, the beast has always been here in Satan the devil. So this goes clear back to the time of Abel. Clear forward to the last of the saints that are resurrected. All together. So this is a vast sea of glass. And we're going to see what's going to take place up there. And we're going to see what a marvelous and wonderful time this is going to be. Now notice verse 3. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So there you have it. Old Testament, New Testament. Saying, Great and awesome are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of saints. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy, and all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments are revealed. And after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And then out came the seven angels with the seven last plagues. All right. Now that we see what's going to happen here, let's find out some things from the book of Psalms which tells us some very interesting things. All right? Number one, let's come back to Psalm 24. Jesus Christ was the first of the first fruit. And there was joy in heaven when he was resurrected. Psalm 24. Let's come back there. Let's see what took place when Jesus came. And remember, there's a sea of glass where the throne of God is in Revelation 4 and 5. When he came to the sea of glass to be accepted of the Father on the wave sheaf offering day. And the angels were there, and they were singing, and there was music, and it was a glorious time. Because the sacrifice of God through Jesus Christ as the Son of God was perfected. And he was raised from the dead, and now ascended into heaven to be received of God the Father. And there had to be the sea of glass, because that's what it tells us in Revelation 4 and 5, a great sea of glass on which the throne of God sits. Now let's see what the angel said. Now just picture this. Verse 7. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, O you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. And who is the King of glory? None other than Jesus Christ. So he had to go through the gate of righteousness. Now we're going to see that we likewise will go through the gate of righteousness. All right? Verse 8. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And had he just, had he just not overcome Satan the devil? All the demons, all the governments of this world, all the evil that people could probably do to him, or that they did to him. And his was a spiritual battle, and he was mighty in it. That's why he's the first of the first fruits. Lift up your head, O you gates, lift them up, verse 9, you everlasting doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Now let's come back to Psalm 118. Now the same thing is going to happen with us, brethren. This is something. When we put this all together and understand what God has in store for us 
and we realize the truth that Pentecost pictures the first resurrection and that that's when we're going to be changed from flesh to spirit, to be changed from corruption to incorruptibility, to be changed from mortal to immortality, to be changed from flesh into spirit. Now we're going to be accepted of God the Father because in Hebrews the second chapter in verse 13, Jesus will say, when we're all there standing on the sea of glass, he will say, behold, the children that God has given me. We are the children of the Father given to Jesus Christ. All right, Psalm 118 and verse 19. Verse 19, open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. The same gate that Jesus went through. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner, uh, headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now notice verse 24. And the Protestants use this to justify Sunday keeping. And this has to do with the day we are accepted at the throne of God as the resurrected sons and daughters, now glorified spirit beings, standing before the throne of God. We have entered in through that gate. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. All right, now let's look at a couple of other verses that are very important. Let's come here to Isaiah, the 66th chapter. Isaiah 66, because here it talks about the resurrection. And here it talks about us who are being resurrected as a nation of priests and kings. I mean, this is fantastic brethren, this is fantastic stuff for us to understand, okay? Let's pick it up here, Isaiah 66. All right. Now this is talking about us, verse 6. A sound of noise from the city, a sound from the temple, the sound of the Lord repaying his enemies. And we're going to have part in repaying the enemies. And notice what he says here, verse 7. Before she travailed, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a man-child. Now that's talking about Christ. Now then it, it talks about us. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things as these? Shall the earth, and we're buried in the earth, resurrection, correct, be made to bring forth in one day to be born again? Or will a nation be born at once? Yes, the spiritual nation of the resurrected saints. For as soon as Zion travailed, she also gave birth to her children. Will I bring to the birth and not cause to be born, says the Lord? Shall I cause, shall I cause them to be born and shut the womb, says your God? Of course not. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her. All who love her rejoice for her for joy with her, all who mourn for her. And then it talks about we will be delighted with the fullness of her glory. 
Now let's look at one more chapter here in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 26. Very interesting. Now let's ask a question. Isaiah 26, we'll begin here in just a minute. When we're converted, we have the circumcision of the heart. Is that correct? Yes. And as Paul wrote, he who is a Jew is one who is a Jew inwardly, and the circumcision is of the heart, not of the flesh. And he was including all the Gentiles with it. Now we know that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, correct? All right. Let's read it. Isaiah 26 and verse 1. In that day, and that's the day of the resurrection, this song shall be sung in the land of Judah and probably before the throne of God. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as our walls and banks. Open the gates so that the righteous nation shall enter in. One that is faithfully keeping truth. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For God the Lord is the everlasting rock. Now that's probably part of the song we're going to sing up there on the sea of glass. Now, what else is going to happen on the Sea of Glass? Well, there are quite a few things that are going to happen on the Sea of Glass. Okay? Number one, we're going to be presented to God the Father as his children. Okay? Number two, and we'll include this in the list that we have here. Okay? Number two, the saints will receive their new name. We've been promised that. Number three, the saints will re receive their rewards. Number four, the saints will receive their assignments as kings and priests. Number five, the marriage of the Lamb and his bride will take place. The marriage supper will take place. Number six, the number seven, the saints will witness the seven last plagues poured out, the vengeance of God, that starts the battle of Armageddon. Now we'll come back and we'll look at the scriptures and we'll put them together and we will see that yes, we will see the vengeance of God. That's what he has promised all the saints that we will see. The seventh plague will be the battle of Armageddon. Number eight, then we'll be gathered together into God's army and we'll fight with Christ as we return to the earth with Jesus to establish the kingdom and government of God on earth. So that's a tremendous thing, brethren, that's going to happen. All right there on the sea of glass. Now then, let's come back to Revelation 15. So God has everything prepared, everything ready to go. It's just the timing when the harvest is ripe and the timing according to the schedule of God's plan. So now, let's think again. From the Pentecost of the resurrection until trumpets is four and a half months. That's time that after the resurrection that we will see Satan the devil, the beast, and the false prophet will gather all nations together to fight at Armageddon. Okay? So let's see it. Let's pick it up here. Chapter 15 and verse 6. After the temple was opened, verse 5, then verse 6. And the seven angels who had the seven last plagues came out of the temple, 
So that's going to be right there with the Sea of Glass. And that Sea of Glass is called Mount Zion. And God the Father will come down and accept us as his children. We will see him. We'll be spirit beings. This will be a time of great joy. And also a time of great slaughter of the enemy. They were clothed with linen, pure and bright, and girded about the chest with golden breastplates. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lives into the ages of eternity. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter inside the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Then they're all poured out here. Chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go and pour out your pour out the vials of the wrath of God onto the earth. And the first angel went out, poured his vial onto the earth, and an evil and grievous sore fell upon the men who had the mark of the beast and upon those who were worshiping his image. Now you will notice that the weapons of God are always the same. You can go back and read that in the book of Exodus. And there are many things that we can get from Exodus that parallel what we find on a worldwide scale in the book of Revelation. So he poured out his vial into the sea and it became blood. They want blood? God gives them blood. They want death? God gives them death like that of a dead man, and every living soul in the sea died. Man is not going to have one vestige of anything left that is going to carry over into the millennium. Every idol is going to be destroyed. Every temple is going to be destroyed. Every underground cavern and under the cities and in the mountains where they secretly carried out their wicked deeds will be crushed and ground to nothing. And a third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and they became came blood. Then I heard the angel of the waters say, You are righteous, O Lord. Now you see the way God looks at things, and the angels look at things on the earth, and human behavior is entirely different than what men look at. Men look at that and say, Oh, well, how can a God of love possibly do this? Number one, they don't understand God. And number two, they don't understand his love. And number three, they don't understand his plan. But from God's point of view, the righteous angel says, concerning pouring these things out, you are righteous, O Lord, who are and who was, even the Holy One, in that you have executed this judgment. For they have poured out the blood of saints and of prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Yes, God avenges the blood of his saints. And I heard another voice from the altar say, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial on, upon the sun, and power was given to it to scorch men with fire, a sudden blast. And it says back in uh, one of the prophets that the sun becomes seven times hotter. Whew! And that heat scorches men and kills them. Not all of them. Some survive. And they blasphemed the name of God who had authority over these plagues and did not repent to give him glory. See, some people just won't ever repent. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnashed, gnashed with their nod with their tongues of because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, yet they did not repent. 
Now God is going to give them another opportunity to think that they can win. So after these first five plagues come, there's going to be a little respite. The sixth angel poured out his vial into the river Euphrates, and its waters were dried up so that the way of the kings from the rising of the sun might be prepared. Remember that army of 200 million stretching all the way back from the, from the Holy Land, clear back to all the nations of the east and the north. 200 million. They are going to think now they have used all their weapons. Now comes the grand deception. Verse 13. Isn't that interesting? Verse 13. Then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet for they are spirits of demons working miracles going forth to the kings of the earth even of the whole world to gather them together to the battle of the great day of the almighty God. Boy, that's going to be something. Now, always, as God does, he gives a chance of repentance whenever we read these things. I don't know about you, but a lot of these things almost take my breath away. They are so awesome and just fearful coming upon the earth. So he says, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is the one who is watching and keeping his garments so that he may not walk naked and they may not see his shame. Direct message to who? The Laodiceans. Because we can read this and understand it. We better take heed. Then he gathered them together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from heaven from the throne saying, It is finished! Now then we come to chapter 19. Chapter 19. Here we have, after that, there is great celebration of all the saints on the sea of glass with God the Father, with Jesus Christ, with all the holy angels that this whole satanic system is being destroyed. And now, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, after receiving all of the things we need to receive, we are ready. Do you think that God ever does anything without preparation? Of course not. He's been preparing us all through these years. Now, everything is going to translate into action as spirit beings, now resurrected from the dead, now fighting with Christ and to fulfill what Jesus said. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, and we will be his servants, and yes, we will fight. So we will see the battle start with the beginning of the seven last plagues. And after the seventh plague is poured out on Armageddon, there, the armies will still be there. Some more coming in from the east. And we're going to come down with Christ and finish the job. So we find that in chapter 19 and verse 11. And it reads, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness does he judge and make war. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and a name written that no one knows except him. Had many names, but this particular name that God the Father has given him at this point, no one knows. 
and he was clothed with a garment dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Go clear back to John, the first chapter, first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. All right? Verse 14, and the armies in heaven were following him. That's us. Now this is one fight I want to be a part of. And this is one fight that all the saints can rejoice in. That we have the power and authority from Jesus Christ to come down and to put an end to the armies of this world. And under Christ to set up the kingdom of God. Now, this comes down to the Feast of Trumpets. So we'll project forward concerning this. We'll come back to it on the day of the Feast of Trumpets. But let's see what it says here, okay? Verse 16, And on his garment and on his thigh he had a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of chief captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and of all, free and bond, small and great, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war with him who sits on the horse and with his army. And God has a special treat for the beast and the false prophet. It's called the lake of fire. Well, I got a little bit ahead into the Feast of Trumpets, but that gives us a complete picture. And I went over time just a little bit, so we'll go ahead and end it here. And we'll pick up the story again from the Bible concerning the Feast of Trumpets.